Hey guys, welcome back. Um, Tim's takeaway part two of the vodcast for the human body. And this time we're going to break into uh, the respiratory system. And we'll be taking a look at uh, some images again, um, just as we saw through the first part. Works better if you're looking at it from a video standpoint, but if you're listening to this in your car or anything like that, hopefully um, you will still get some review from it. So let's go ahead and we shall take a look at the respiratory system. All right, so as we saw in the first part of our uh, video or our vodcast in part one, um, we're using the website human.biodigital.com and um, you know if you go ahead and take a look at that you should have the ability to take a look at a lot of the diagrams that I'm currently using and I would highly encourage you to go ahead and do that if you're really looking at some stuff. So let's break into the respiratory system and take a look at what the anatomy is like. So, um, as you can see here, we're dealing primarily with, uh, we just have the skeletal system and uh, the respiratory system, a little bit of the um, integumentary or the skin is in here as well. But for this demonstration, we're going to start right up here. We're going to take a look at the um, upper airway is actually going to consist of the mouth, the nose. Um, we have our tongue that's in here. We'll see that in a pull away in a little bit. We have our mandible. Um, and we're also dealing with um, our larynx, which is now going to be where that dividing line is between the upper and lower airways. Now, our pharynx, which is um, one of those things, let's see if we can get in here a little bit. Okay, So our pharynx is going to be right in, whoo, sorry, he just kind of flipped around there for me. Um, so our pharynx is actually going to be right up in this area okay so where I'm talking is going to be right in this area here so our pharynx is actually going to be part of our um, nasopharynx we have a nasopharynx we also have an oropharynx so um, you will probably have to deal with the fact that a little bit later on we will be dealing with um, um, we will be dealing with the airway management section, and we will talk about oral and nasopharyngeal airways and why and exactly where they are actually um, applicable to. So some of the other things we'll take a look at is going to be the trachea, and as you can see right here is the trachea, and then we'll also take a look at the epiglottis, um, which is going to be a thin leaf shaped flap. That's kind of tough to see in here, so let's take a different view. Let me get that humerus out of here. I don't think we need to look at that, right? All right, so this here is a uh, picture of a real epiglottis. And when we take a look at that real epiglottis, one of the things that we're taking a look at is, is that this area right in here is going to be what the epiglottis is. Okay? So what you can see is that here is the tongue and here is that epiglottis, okay? This here is the uvula. So when we're taking a look at this, you can tell that the epiglottis is actually going to be uh, it is floppy. It is a pretty much like a leaf shape, and it actually goes over the trachea when you are um, uh, going to eat, and it goes over the esophagus whenever you're going to take in some air. So it is a flappy um, type structure and we see this quite frequently for many issues um, and just for basic airway or for our, I should say advanced airway, this area where the tongue and the epiglottis meet is going to be known as the vallecula and that vallecula is just basically a space. Okay. Uh, but what we need to remember is that all of this area right here is that epiglottis. And one of our problems that we'll find out later on is that this can swell up and cause us to have some problems um, in clearing secretions. And while it may be primarily for kids, 
it is not unusual for having it in adults today as well. Okay, so again, that epiglottis is going to be sitting right up in this area, and um, what you were seeing here is the trachea. Now, one of the areas you do need to make sure that you're being uh, that you're aware of is going to be that cricoid uh, cartilage, and that cricoid cartilage or that Adam's apple. Uh, I'm sorry, the thyroid cartilage is the Adam's apple, um, which is laying right here. Then as we come distally, again, using that language from earlier, um, we're actually going to um, come down into the cricoid cartilage, and then we are going to come into this cricoid thyroid membrane. Let's see if we can zoom this in here and show you exactly what we're taking a look at. Okay, so the cricoid thyroid, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. The cricoid, the cricothyroid membrane is right here. And what ends up happening here is that this is a direct line into the trachea. So oftentimes, um, if a paramedic or an advanced level provider, including a physician, um, would need to perform a surgical airway or would need to perform some type of airway maneuver in which they need to stick a needle or a uh, scalpel in here they will open this up and they have now direct line into the trachea now the trachea um, if we can see that the trachea um, actually comes down and it divides and when it divides it divides into the right and to the left now here is and just so that we can Make sure that we're aware, okay? This is going to be the right lung. This is going to be the left lung. Okay, so our trachea is coming down. And where we divide this area right in here is going to be the cricoid, or I'm sorry, is going to be the carina, okay? So let's take a look at that again. This right here is going to be the carina. This is the dividing line, or this is the dividing area between the right and the left main stem bronchus. Now, as I said, that this branches, and when it branches off, it goes into the right and the left main stem bronchus. Okay, so from that, we're actually going to come in here and we're going to dissect some of this out of here, so you can see what is happening. Now, when we take this away, you can see that. These all here are going to be related to the bronchus. And these are, um, so let me erase that. There we go. So this here is going to be a main stem bronchus, and this here will be a main stem bronchus. And the other thing that you can take a look at is all of these smaller areas, like right in through here, all in through here, those are bronchi. Okay, so they are going down and they are going to end up forming in, in ending with the alveoli. So one way that I try to remember this is to realize that, oops, sorry, that this can actually be a, if you look at it from the standpoint of, well, maybe this is a tree, and hence the reason why they now call it a um, you know the bronchial tree because everything that you see here if I were to change this into fall um, we would find out that this is like leaves okay so almost like this we're turning this into a tree and this is essentially what we're looking at just picture all these little green things that are here not only are they leaves but we're also dealing with the fact that they are now going to be um, the alveoli that we'll be dealing with a little bit later on, right? So hopefully you get the point that it almost looks like it is just a nice, big, bushy tree, okay? And here is your roots that are right down here, which would end up being your trachea, okay? Now, as I said earlier, um, one of the issues that you're going to deal with um, is going to be how the bronchioles are actually working, okay? So again, as we come down through, we've gone from the right main stem and the left main stem bronchus, and we're branching down into smaller bronchioles, 
and you can see here that there are much smaller smooth muscles and there are some type of elastic fibers that exist here so these can actually constrict and I think we saw that in our um, uh, if we go back and take a look at the muscular system we found out that these are some type of smooth muscles and therefore they can constrict and dilate and they can basically tighten up or loosen up either way you look at it um, one way or the other they basically do that expand contract uh, constrict dilate those types of issues um, so when you take a look at these things they are they have the ability to tighten up and when we listen to lung sounds we're essentially listening down into all of these areas but if they are constricting down you can actually hear some air that is that is going through them and it actually forms what is going to be referred to as a wheeze. We'll hear more about that as we deal with the anatomy and or I'm sorry as we deal with the patient assessment. But this shows you where we're at. The actual gas exchange is going to occur here in the alveoli. So the alveoli as you can see here they look like these wonderful little grape structures and they are these wonderful little grape structures but um, in addition to that these things that you see all through here are nothing more than these areas right in here I'm sorry yeah these areas right in here are going to be part of those capillaries and this is where that actual gas exchange is going to take place and that gas exchange is going to take place and this is where we have co2 that is a waste product it goes out of the body and we bring O2 in or oxygen and that actually is coming in okay so O2 CO2 which either way um, you want to start taking a look at these this is where the actual gas exchange takes place at that alveoli level so um, we had just brought up all about the fact that we were looking at the alveoli now we're going to break it apart and we're going to also take a look at the way that we are utilizing muscles to breathe and this part right in here which you can see moving up and down this nice little dome shape is actually your diaphragm and you can see that the diaphragm is moving up and down so this is inhaling you can see that it is um, relaxing and then it contracts to push air back out these this is basically what's happening is is you're changing the pressures in that intrathoracic space so we talked about you know some language earlier that this is the intrathoracic area which is going to be with inside the chest cavity and here you can see that this is a dome shaped area this dome shaped area can be utilized for um, the separation basically it's not utilized it is the separation between the abdominal cavity and the chest cavity and this is a um, muscle that is actually going to divide that thorax, the thorax from the abdomen okay so we can see that the the nice little holes that are here are actually going to be areas for us to um, bring our major vessels through which we'll see a little bit later on but uh, vena cava um, your aorta those types of things are going to come down through here and you can see that we are expanding and contracting our chest and as we relax and now we contract you can see that we're changing the pressures inside the chest and as we saw with the bones that all of these areas are now in here to protect the lungs and of course the heart so one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the right lung has three lobes and here is a great this would be a lateral view you're looking here is one lobe here is two lobes and here is three lobes so there's one two three lobes that are going to consist of the right lung and when we come over here to the um, left lung went a little bit too fast spun them all the way around when we look at the left lung we see that there's only one two so there's essentially only two lobes there and again if you turn around these are the areas in which you're going to take a listen for when you need to do breath sounds and you're going up in this area and down low and then of course when we look at our axillary area we also can take a listen right in through this area and then of course we want to make sure that we're listening up above in the middle and we can go down below so this way you're hitting one 
two, three lobes. Okay. Yeah. So that's what you take a look at in relationship to the way that we're going to be taking a look at the different lobe. Okay. So we saw that there was the diaphragm. Now there are some other muscles that we definitely need to make sure that we're taking a look at. Um, so when we inhale, um, one of the other muscles that we may see that people are trying to utilize is going to be their neck muscles. Okay, so we can see that their cervical neck muscles are going to be used, their abdominal muscles, and then, of course, their pectoral muscles, which are going to be their pecs. One area that I'm going to rotate around here just a little bit, and probably really good to see right in through here. And we'll see if we can zoom this up without it going all over the place. Okay, is going to be our intercostal muscles. Now, these intercostal muscles are actually where we're going to have um, the muscles moving in the ribs. So they're going up and out, and they actually help enlarge that chest cavity, and they allow the pressure changes inside the lungs and inside that intrathoracic pressure inside that chest to actually allow air to come in and to move out. So as described earlier, you know, respiration or ventilation, and then of course we have um, oxygenation. So we're going to take a look at those three terms and how they apply to us. Um, our first one is going to be taking a look at what is that whole ventilation. Well, ventilation is actually just that simple movement of air into and out of the lungs. And we're going to take a look at some things with that, including tidal volume, um, which is going to be how much air you move in and out of the lungs in one breath, the residual volume, or the amount of air or gas that is remaining inside the lungs that basically keeps it open. As you're looking at this diagram, you notice that the lungs do not completely deflate. There's still some air in there so that it helps keep the lungs open. We'll talk about minute volume, which is going to be the air or the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs in about one minute. And we'll also talk about um, what dead space is and how that plays a factor in things that we take a look at. So really, um, one way of looking at minute volume is actually um, to take the patient's respiratory rate, which would be their respiratory rate, okay, times, whoop, that didn't work too well, times their tidal volume, and it actually gives you your minute volume, okay? So, um, again, another way to take a look at this is, is that, well, their respiratory rate. Typically, their respiratory rate is between 12 and 20 times a minute. Their tidal volume on average is probably about 500 milliliters. And what does that equate to? So the amount of air that you bring in in each breath. Again, is that tidal volume? How much is that? It's about 500 milliliters, which comes out to roughly the size of a, of a uh, bottle of water. So 16.9 ounce bottle essentially comes out to 500 milliliters. And that's pretty much how much we end up bringing in. Now, when we get into airway management, we'll discuss the use of a bag valve mask and how we're probably doubling that total amount. Um, and, uh, well, let me rephrase that. There's in the bag that we use, there's double the amount of what we would normally expect in that tidal volume. So we'll take a look at how that can affect us later on. So... We saw about ventilation. Now what about oxygenation? So what you see here is a cell. Respiration occurs in two places. One place that it occurs is in the cell. And this means that oxygen, which is being delivered by the blood, is now going to go into the cell. And then CO2, which is the byproduct of normal metabolism actually leaves the cell. Okay, so this is the exchange. This is the exchange that we're expecting to see at that cellular level. This is respiration. Now, question that you have to come up with 
is what are we talking about when it comes to the alveoli? Okay, so we're just going to make a fake little alveoli here. Okay, so with that little fake alveoli, the same thing is occurring. We are bringing the um, CO2, remember that the CO2 is now going to be outside, it's going to be inside of the, uh, um, the cells, or I'm sorry, it's going to be inside of the blood, and then we are now exchanging that. We are bringing a CO2, um, and we're putting it into the alveoli, and we're taking the um, oxygen, which has now just been breathed out, breathed in, we just brought it in, and we're now exchanging it here. So we're doing the same process, um, just going to be at different locations. Oftentimes you will hear people refer to these as being internal respiration and external Okay, external meaning that they are going to occur inside the alveoli and with the blood, and internal is usually dealing more with the cellular level. Okay, so how does all this occur then? It occurs through a process known as diffusion. Now, what happens with diffusion is that we have an area of higher concentration and these move to an area of lower concentration. So with diffusion, it is that area where oxygen molecules are moving in the area where higher concentration of molecules are there, right? So we just said about those right in here, and we're moving those over until there's a lower concentration. So we're moving those by a process known as diffusion. Now, a way in which respiration is actually being identified is um, by the medulla. Now, the medulla is up in the brain, and it is monitoring the CO2 levels. So we're monitoring those carbon dioxide levels inside the blood. And any time that there is a problem where it actually is elevated, the medulla kicks in and increases our respiratory rates. We're trying to get rid of that. Think of it in one aspect. If you're exercising, you're running out of breath. The reason that you're doing that is that if you go back and take a look at the muscles, that the muscles are working, they're warming up. As they're warming up, they are now producing more. They are actually increasing the use of their energy. And as a result of that, more CO2 is building up. So they need to get rid of the CO2, and we also need to put more oxygen in there. As I mentioned earlier with ventilation, I'm just going to hit this real quick again, um, is that the respiratory rate is going to run anywhere between 12 and 20 times a minute. When you take that times the tidal volume, which again is somewhere around at 500 milliliters, when we take those um, and we multiply those together, that's what we're going to get with the minute volume. Now, Keep in mind, we're probably almost guaranteed not measuring the total amount of the tidal volume. But what we are looking for is breathing patterns. We're looking to see whether or not people are utilizing um, muscles, if they're using those muscles that we had talked about earlier with respiration, whether or not they're utilizing intercostal muscles, and we start to see the dose pull in as a result of breathing difficulty. People are starting to get tired and they're not able to bring in as much air. So the respiratory rate increases, but they're not bringing in as much air. Um, we talk about people that are lean forward. They're trying to allow the pressures inside their chest to take over and work just a little bit better to allow people to breathe some more. But these all become problems. And while we may not be able to measure this number adequately, look at the patient okay so we need to look at the patient and we need to see exactly what it is that they are feeling like look at the patient and when we see that their breathing is is um, doing well 
then their title volume most likely is okay. When they're not doing well, we have to look and see whether or not their title volume is low. Okay, so I think that pretty much does it for um, the respiratory system. In our next section, we're going to take a look at this circulatory system. All right, we'll see you in a few.